we are up to 24 subscribers now that's like let's call it let's call it a quarter hundred not bad we're getting there thank you so much for your support so far um, to anyone who has um, shared or promoted or liked my work um, thank you so much because it helps and I'd hate to see this be forever doomed to obscurity all right well with that mermaids the sea even with modern scuba equipment and cameras is a mysterious and foreign world to us. It's beautiful and supplies so much of the world with food, yet it's dark, unknown, and dangerous. Is there any wonder why cultures that have historically lived off of the sea invariably have a number of stories and superstitions about the sort of creatures and places that may exist deep below the waves? The basic idea of the mermaid a half-person, half-fish hybrid, usually female and usually very pretty, is found all around the world. The widespread presence of the mermaid in European folklore persists to this day, though perhaps the typical modern view stems from the Disney film The Little Mermaid, which is based on, though in many details, strays from Hans Christian's and Hans Christian Andersen's Den Lille Havre, which is my uh, poor attempt at pronouncing Danish. Um, the Swedes often say that Danish is just Swedish with a potato in your mouth, and I kind of agree. Uh, Hans Christian Andersen, he's sort of the Brothers Grimm of Denmark, uh, being also a 19th century folklorist who tasked himself with compiling fairy tales from the Danish countryside just as with the Brothers Grimm. His tales have become culturally embedded in the collective consciousness of the Western world, which is quite a feat, I must say. The original tale of The Little Mermaid is much darker and has certain Christian elements that are lost in the Disney film. For example, one reason why the mermaid wants to walk on land is that mermaids were said to not have souls, and that upon their death their spirit would dissolve into the waves and be destroyed rather than rise up to heaven. But by taking a human in marriage, she would gain part of his soul and be allowed to enter heaven upon death. The sea witch, which is the frightening octopus lady, I believe she called, she's called Ursula in the film, uh, she also she doesn't take the Little Mermaid's voice uh, because she wants it for herself. Uh, she just gives her a potion that will turn her into a person, but the catch, a sort of payment for the potion to work, is that it takes her voice away upon drinking it. Uh, and furthermore, she feels as though a sword is stabbed through her when she drinks it, and whenever she steps on land it feels as though sharp knives are under her feet. Um, in spite of that, she can dance really well, which is some bullshit, I must say. <laughs> um, that's just really cruel. Um, the witch doesn't actually have wicked intent. Uh, this is just sort of the exchange rate for becoming a person for whatever reason. Uh, furthermore, uh, she doesn't get married by her love. In the end, she dies. Uh, despite the terribleness of the deal, she agrees and she drinks the potion. Uh, also different than the Disney film, perhaps for good reason, is that the prince cheats on her and ends up marrying someone else, and this, ca this would cause her to die as like another terrible stipulation of the, the potion, is that she dies if the, the prince marries someone else. And she considers taking revenge and murdering the prince, but she decides not to. But upon her death, uh, 
because she didn't kill him and was a good human her whole life, she's granted with a soul upon her death and was allowed to rise to heaven. In Ireland and Scotland is a sacred being called the Selkie. Seals are all of them fairies. They are of sacred significance in the native Gaelic religion. The Selkie, also called Silkies in Ireland, can transform back and forth between seal and human. Some sources say that they are people only at night and seals during the day, but other tales depict them going back and forth out of necessity. Seals were people in previous lives, so they spend their time at sea pining for life on land, but when they come on land, typically coaxed by a lover, after a while they begin to pine again for life at sea, and eventually have to return, even if that means leaving their husband and child. The life of the Selkie is that of longing. They never feel that they're in the right place, always on the fence between two worlds. When they turn into people, they shed an oily seal skin that they have to don to turn back into a seal, and whoever has this skin becomes the Selkie's master. If you take one as a wife, they do, and they do come in male and female, but most of the stories are about women. Fishermen finding love with mermaids and similar creatures is such a common story. As I was saying, if you do take one as a wife, it's typical in stories that you keep the skin hidden if you want to keep her with you. That lovely book I talked about in the Leprechaun episode, yeah, that one. Uh, there's a story about a fisherman who takes a selkie for a wife. It's very beautiful and I highly recommend. I considered just reading the text for this video, but it's a bit long and I don't want to rip off the author. Another excellent story on Selkies I recommend is the 1994 movie The Secret of Ronanish. Ronanish being Gaelic for Seal Island. It's genuinely a lovely film. The Marrow is another kind of mermaid found off the coast of Ireland. They're scaly like a fish and possess fins. The males are known for delighting in liquor fallen off the hulls of ships. The male marrows don't have a reputation for being particularly handsome, with their red noses, green teeth, and skin. So it's only natural that their females would gravitate towards human sailors. The female marrow, unlike their male counterpart, is quite the looker indeed. She wears a lovely frock, the white of sea foam, accented with bits of red and purple seaweed. Sometimes a black cloak clings to her figure, as well as a red cap. Because of the salt water, her hair is said to shine like the morning dew. Playful and lively by nature, she uses her feminine charms to lure sailors to her rock, and unlike the Greek siren, Rather than simply killing the sailor, she swims off and a storm starts, potentially wrecking the ship. On occasion, she will leave the sea and find a husband on land, where she becomes less lively and playful and more of a caring and submissive disposition. A married marrow never laughs, but when she again dons her red cap, her playful nature returns to her and at once she shifts gears and abandons her husband and even crying child on land. In general, it seems like if mermaids don't kill you, they make lovely wives until they leave you. Less favorable to meet are the number of seahorses in Ireland and Scotland. When I say seahorse, I don't mean the fish, although those do make me want to point out how all over Europe there's an interesting connection between horses and the sea. The Greek god Poseidon was a god of the sea and also of horses, and there's also the Greek hippocampus, which just means seahorse. It is a seahorse, but not a seahorse, the latter being one word and the former not. This connection is not lost in Ireland and Scotland. Consider the Scottish Kelpie. 
that same Scottish fairy tale book I keep mentioning and throwing at my desk has a tale that does well to explain the Kelpies. Again, please buy that book or borrow it from me if you're one of my friends or family watching this. I highly recommend. If late at night you see a large black horse wandering around a loch, you'd do well not to go and tame it despite the impulse to do so. As soon as you sit on its back, it begins slowly wandering into the loch, and in your confusion, you struggle to control it, and you realize that your legs are firmly bound to the horse by some kind of magic. Panic setting in, you struggle to get off, but it's too late. You submerge under the water and struggle until you drown. The Kelpie returns to land without you, waiting to beckon its next victim. I can't mention Celtic water horses without mentioning the horrid Nukalavi from the Orcadian Isles in the north of Scotland. Be glad you've never encountered one. The Nukalavi is not merely a horse, but a horse and rider. But the rider has no legs, simply a torso fused to a horse back. That wouldn't be so bad if not for its lack of skin. If ever it had any, who can say? The natives of the islands it was said to inhabit were so terrified of it that they wouldn't say its name unless immediately saying a prayer after. The only being able to control it is the Mither of the Sea, and that's that's not Mother, it's Mither, which is the word Mother, it's just a dialectal variant, so it's kind of funny, the Mither of the Sea, um, who, the Mither of the Sea is the only being who can control the Nakalavi, uh, but only in the summer months is she able to contain it. The Nukalavi strides out of the water to do its terrorism on land. Some say that it can scarcely tolerate fresh water, and so crosses streams only out of necessity. Its breath causes sickness in animals, and it causes plants to wilt. It's responsible for droughts and famines. Just as deadly, and perhaps just as terrifying, is the Irish Dullahan. The Dullahan is a headless horseman riding a headless horse. His skin is the color and texture of rotting cheese, and he holds his head under one arm, his mouth making a bridge from ear to ear, and the pupils of his enormous eyes dart about like flies. The horse's head, which has flaming eyes, because of course it does, floats nearby. Despite having no attached eyes, his aim with the whip is impeccable, unfortunately for his victims, whom he uses this skill to torment. He will also poke out the eyes of said victims before killing them, since he is jealous of their ability to see. His horse only ever stops when someone is about to die by his hand. Once a man was invited for a drink by a company of Dullahan. He accepted, because what else can you do in that situation? And apparently they had a good night, though perhaps he didn't, owing to the terror he was in the whole time. Just as they were leaving, they lobbed off his head with roaring laughter, and when he woke up in the morning, his head suddenly reconnected with his body, and he was right as rain as though it had never happened. It is said that death himself is their master, and occasionally the Dullahan will also ride in a coach made of human bones and worm-chewed fabric sitting beside him is a banshee. I suppose I'll talk about banshees now, since when else am I going to talk about them? Banshee is derived from the Gaelic words ban and she, meaning woman and fairy respectively, and so a banshee is a fairy woman, and not a, not a woman fairy, um, because adjectives follow the noun in Gaelic, so it's a fairy woman, not a 
woman fairy, banshee, fairy woman. We typically think of fairies as pretty, happy, winged women, but that is not always the case, as fairy often serves as a generic term for any mythical creature. When a descendant of the old Irish heroes, or in other words, all Irish people, and I guess all Scottish people too, since the Scots were originally from Ireland and migrated over to Northern Britain, as I was saying, when a descendant of the old Irish heroes is about to die, the banshee wails out for them. She is reminded of the deaths of the old Irish heroes, whom she still mourns the loss of. Her cry is called keening, and each keen reminds her of the centuries of glory behind them. So she wails out as though about to be struck by a sword. When an Irish person is dying, she wanders the hills, she wanders the dark hills near their home, which she points the way to from her hill. Her silvery gray hair and white gray cloak with a cobweb texture contrasts the night's darkness, and in the cold and in her grief she shivers. She's thin as a twig, and her face pale as a corpse, and her eyes red from centuries of crying. She is also called the White Lady of Sorrow and the Lady of Death. Her cry can be heard at funerals, though she often goes unnoticed. Each banshee has a family lineage that they are tied to. She will cross oceans to the New World out of the love of her kin, and some say that they howl with delight when their enemies die. The Dullahan, Kelpie, and Nukalavi, as well as other seahorses, are ultimately derived from the old Ga Gaelic Each Ishka, meaning water horse, which is a similar sort of beast. These certainly aren't the only beings in the lochs, seas, and springs of northern Europe. The Shetland Nuggle, the Norwegian Nock, and the Tangies of the Orkney and Shetland Isles, as well as a slew of other spirits, horses, and fairies, terrorize and protect the North Sea. However, I don't always have a good source for these creatures. Catherine Briggs is a good source for this sort of thing, but... Ooh. Ooh. That... That's a little pricey. It's a, it's a little pricey. I guess I'll have to work with what I have. And with that, thank you so much for watching.